You are listening to The Overwhelmed Brain. Today's episode is brought to you by Care.com. Save 30% off a premium membership when you subscribe at Care.com forward slash brain. That sounds incredible. Are you annoyed by affirmations? Are you tired of that same old rehashed personal growth advice that all seems to boil down to think positively and all your problems will go away? If affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial, then I want you to get ready. The Overwhelmed Brain is here to help you create the life you want now. Welcome to The Overwhelmed Brain. I am your host, personal empowerment coach, Paul Coliani. I am here to help you increase your emotional intelligence, strengthen your self-worth and self-esteem, and empower you so that you can make decisions that are right for you. Everything I talk about on this show is my personal opinion and is meant for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your medical treatment. All right, first topic is something I know nothing about. (laughs) Well, I shouldn't say that, but uh, I know some things about it in the way I know about it, which is uh, PTSD uh, when it comes to... um, I don't know, coming back from the military and having had experiences that you just can't erase. I got received an email from someone I'm going to call Mary. She said, I discovered your podcast and it has kept me sane and breathing more than once. That's good to hear, Mary. I recently fled a terribly abusive relationship, physical and emotional. He was a lovely man when I married him 16 years ago, but after many tours overseas with the armed forces, he came back with severe PTSD. I stayed with him for years of hell because I had felt guilty. I even had a counselor ask me if I would abandon him if it was cancer instead. Ouch, she said, not supportive at all. My question is, can you speak to the overlap of PTSD, specifically with narcissistic abuse? I still struggle daily with feelings of guilt. Thanks for your time and the work you do. Take care, Mary. Okay, Mary, I am so happy to hear that you are out of an abusive relationship. And uh, I said that I don't really know much about uh, PTSD because it's not something that I I get into or study too much. At the same time, it is a severe form of, I would say, emotional triggers. And the only way I can relate to PTSD is when I talk about when I was seven and I received an enema and it was so traumatic that for years and years, up until my 40s, no one could get near that area of my body. It was off limits. Don't even go there. Don't even go close. Don't even think about going there. And so it it was a real phobic response. And uh, PTSD, you know, I would say takes that to the extreme limit. Like the uh, four symptoms of PTSD, according to uh, ptsd.va.gov, are reliving the event, also called re-experiencing the symptoms, uh, avoiding situations that remind you of the event, having more negative beliefs and feelings, and they go on to say the way you think about yourself and others may change because of the trauma, you may feel guilt or shame, you may not be interested in activities you used to enjoy, you may feel that the world is dangerous and you can't trust anyone, You might be numb or find it hard to feel happy. And the fourth one is feeling keyed up or hyper aroused. You may be jittery or always on alert or on the lookout for danger. Or you may have trouble concentrating or sleeping. You might suddenly get angry or irritable, uh, startle easily or act in unhealthy ways like uh, smoking, drugs, and alcohol and driving recklessly. So those are four of the common symptoms of PTSD. And, uh, you know, I would relive the event. And, and I'm talking at a very basic level. This is sort of a PTSD thing for me. This is the only way I can relate to it. So that's why I'm telling you. Uh, I know that PTSD for uh, people who come back from the military, totally different. That's an entirely different experience. I'm just telling you from my uh, level. Uh, avoiding situations that remind you of the event. Uh, absolutely. Don't go near there. <laughs> Having more negative beliefs and feelings. Yes, I believe that's exactly what happened. I uh, just the way I thought about the world and our, uh, and that area of the body and my body definitely changed my perception, different lens of the world. Hyper aroused or hypersensitive, absolutely. So 
in my small case, in my minor case, even though it was major to me, uh, but minor in comparison to a lot of other PTSD, I can say, yes, I probably had PTSD from that event. So I can probably speak on PTSD from that level. Now, your question, however, goes into the overlap of PTSD and narcissistic abuse. Now, narcissistic abuse is when you abuse someone for your own uh, gratification, for your own self-esteem. I mean, I mean, it's a huge topic and probably has more definition than that. But how can I, if I was narcissistic, how can I increase me feeling better by abusing you uh, so that you can, you know, fill my self-esteem, fill my self-worth, show that I am important and make me feel loved and nurtured in the way I want you to. Maybe loved and nurtured isn't the right terms there. But uh, you get the idea. How can I abuse you or how can I do things to you that one might call abuse so that I feel better about myself? So how do you mix those two? That's tough. That's, that's a challenge to take those two and overlap them and go, how can I speak on that? Like I said, I, I honestly can't speak on that overlap. I can talk about them separately but I can't really speak on it from a professional level. What I can say is, instead of focusing on that, let's talk about your guilt. Because guilt is very common when there's any type of what's called traumatic bonding. Traumatic bonding is when you go through repeated abuse and uh, love, or repeated hurt and feeling good. There's a repetition of good and bad in the relationship, but it's abuse and not abuse or abuse and elation or abuse and support and it cycles. And uh, what happens is this happens in childhood a lot, too, is that um, children are presented with something called a uh, double bind situation, which I talked about a few episodes ago, where a parent might say, I love you so much. This is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. But I love you so much. Whack. And they smack them. And the, the child gets a mixed message. And then they go, oh, love equals pain. Got it. So love should include pain and pain should include love. So when I grow up, I'm going to treat my kids like that. I'm going to treat my significant other like that. Because that's what I'm supposed to do. Because that's how I learned. I learned it from my mom. Or my dad. Son, I love you and I'm doing this for your own good. You need to sit in the closet. I'm going to shut the light off. I'm going to lock you in there for six hours. This kind of stuff happens. I love you and I'm putting you in this closet. And you can't come out. It's going to be completely dark. And um, if I remember to let you out in six hours, great. You can eat. If not, then you'll just have to wait until morning. Unfortunately, that kind of stuff does happen. But that's what happens is that the child then gets a mixed idea gets poisonous thoughts put in their heads about what love is. And then they take this mixed reality and bring it into the adult world and suddenly their relationships are failing and people are unhappy that stay with them and they become what I call a toxic person. It's not their fault. They do have a responsibility in their adult stage of life to go, hmm, what am I doing that's causing these problems? When they don't choose to take that responsibility, then they are a problem to themselves and others. And it does take a, a certain level of uh, growth to even realize that you are the problem. They may not realize they're the problem. They just see the world as the problem because they grew up believing this is how you treat others. And so now you mix in it uh, with your question, Mary. Now you mix in something that's really traumatic, like war, like killing people. Uh, that somebody doesn't want to do, but they end up doing it. And then they come home and they have already had maybe a certain level of abuse in their home as a child. And now they have this other thing in the mix. Now they need help. Now they need to go to someone that specializes in this stuff and help them through it because they don't know how to process it. It's just too much for a brain to handle. It's an overwhelm to the extreme. And so that's why I told you my story. It's like I think of my story and how traumatic it was for me in my life. And it's a minor incident compared to what other people go through. Yet 
If it's that traumatic for me for that minor incident, imagine what it must be for other people that go through much worse experiences. War, sexual abuse, any kind of abuse, really, where you relive it over and over again. You can't get away from it. You're hypersensitive to it, on and on. It is a struggle, just like you're struggling daily with feelings of guilt, which is what I need you to focus on. Because I talked about guilt before, where guilt is when you feel like you've done something wrong to someone else. And I always like to get closure on guilt. I don't like to hold on to guilt at all. I like to go, huh, I feel guilty. I got to make up for this right now. I got to fix this right now because I'm not holding on to that guilt because guilt prevents you from doing anything productive with your, I mean, I shouldn't say that, any healing in your life. Guilt prevents you from healing and moving forward in your life. Guilt can prevent a lot of things because what guilt does is tells you that you're not good enough to get anything better because you need to stay guilty because you did something wrong. So it prevents healing. It prevents forward momentum. So what I need you to do is listen to my episode on guilt because you need to eradicate this guilt. I also need you to get the mean workbook. The mean workbook helps you understand what an emotionally abusive relationship is and why you're feeling guilty. Because guilt comes from that traumatic bonding I was talking about. You feel like, I love this person and this person's in pain. So if I leave, it'll put them in more pain. Yet I will stay in the pain in order to show them that I am compassionate for them. Yet I will not show compassion for myself and get out of this dangerous situation. I mean, it goes beyond that. It's really deep. But when you develop guilt for your fear of hurting someone else that is hurting you, especially when their hurt towards you is at a much greater level, a much greater scale, then you have beliefs about yourself that tell you you deserve it at some level. Which makes me wonder if you had an abusive childhood to be and stay in a relationship that abuse is occurring. Because if you had an abusive childhood and you brought beliefs into this relationship that it was okay to be abused because that's part of the love process, then I do hope you are getting the help you need to get beyond these feelings of guilt. And like I said, I like to get closure on guilt. How do you get closure on guilt? I say it in the episode I talk about guilt. I mean, I have several episodes. Just go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com, type in the word guilt, and you'll see a bunch of stuff come up. But in a nutshell, I like to make up for the guilt. If I feel guilty for walking by someone on the street who is apparently homeless and they ask for money and I don't give them money and then I feel bad for it, then I will find a homeless shelter and donate to the homeless shelter. That's what I do with guilt. Like, I feel guilty for that. I better go eradicate this guilt because there's something I feel like I might be able to contribute to the world and make the world better. Do I want to feed this one person for one day or do I want to help a structure that's in place to help people like this? That's what I do with guilt. I felt guilty when I dropped my animals off at the Humane Society when I was like 20 something. I felt so guilty years later when I thought back and go, oh my God, I dropped my cats off there. They could have been killed. They might have been, you know, euthanized. And suddenly all this guilt comes up and I felt so bad and what do I do with this? They're gone. I don't even I don't even know if they're alive anymore. I don't know what happened to them. What am I going to do with this guilt? There's two things I did. One, um, when I was married, my wife and I saved this cat that was, I don't know, sleeping in the snow. I mean, he clearly had no place to live. We had trouble catching him. We finally caught him. And we brought him to a place, a no-kill shelter that uh, took care of cats. We paid uh, to have the vet look at him and bring him up to health, and it turned out he had leukemia, but um, they were able to fix him up and get him healthy again, and he was adopted to a good home. I can't tell you how good that makes me feel. So that uh, helped alleviate some guilt, and the other thing is that um, I made a commitment to myself that no matter what animal I ever get in my life that I ever take care of ever again from that moment on, that I was going to 
treat them better than I've ever treated any animal. And I was going to take care of them. I was going to pay for whatever expenses they they needed. I was to, going to make sure they get the best care and love and support possible. And I did. I took care of my cat for 20 years. He was my buddy. We drove around the country together. He he was my best animal friend. And uh, I took care of him till the day he died. And I feel really good knowing that I made that commitment to animals. So whatever animal comes into my life, I commit to it. And that helped alleviate the guilt. I'm not saying that I don't feel bad for some of the stuff that I did, but you should absolutely have the option to alleviate the guilt from something that you feel guilty about. So I want you to think about what you feel guilty about. Do you feel guilty about the idea that you may have hurt him by leaving him? Then I want you to do something with that guilt. Maybe you can contribute or volunteer to a place that works with people with PTSD. Maybe you can contribute to a structure that uh, will help people like him. Maybe you can help a friend that has been in a similar type of situation. I believe that it's best to direct guilt into something positive so that it creates a better world for you. So it takes away the feeling of blaming yourself. Now, you do have it tougher. You do have a tough situation because when you're in a a traumatic bonding experience where you mix love and pain and you are going through painful elements of a relationship and you feel compassionate uh, toward the person that's actually hurting you, that puts you in a dilemma because you feel like uh, anything you do toward him is your fault. The the problem is with um, what might be manipulation or abuse here is that they set you up on purpose to feel guilty. I mean, that's part of the manipulation, even unintentionally. It's a setup. If you feel guilty, then you won't leave them. So I want this to get through to your mind that you were programmed to feel guilty so that you wouldn't leave them because leaving them doesn't get their needs met. You staying with them gets their needs met. And they don't care if you feel bad as long as you stay. And that's so important to understand. Someone who doesn't care if you feel bad doesn't really love you. I want you to accept that too. He may think he loves you, but you know my definition for love. Supporting your happiness. And someone who makes you feel bad and hurts you doesn't support your happiness and therefore that's not love. I don't mean to say that to be cruel. I want to say that so you come to a level of acceptance that it wasn't about love. It was about his needs. It was never about your needs or from what you described, it doesn't sound like it was ever about your needs. It was about fulfilling him in ways that suited him. So this is important to understand that what you really feel bad about is the fact that he no longer has you to beat on. When you start feeling guilty about leaving him and hurting him, remember it's not hurting him, it's taking away his ability to hurt you. What you really feel guilty about is taking away his pleasure in hurting you. So if you want my opinions on the overlap of PTSD and narcissistic abuse, that's where I go with it. Don't feel guilty. I mean, I don't mean to invalidate your guilty feeling, but just take this as it is. Don't feel guilty for taking away his pleasure in hurting you because that's what's really happening. I know the guilt is there and it comes up and you feel bad because he went through so much, but if he really cares about you, he won't hurt you. And if he really cares about getting better, he'll find help. And if he's not aware that he's a hurtful person or he's gone through a lot of abuse in his childhood, then he'll learn by his results that everything that happens in his life, he is the common denominator. He needs to learn that lesson. If you told him you need to get help, he probably wouldn't listen. I mean, you can try it, certainly. I I think that's a good idea. But, uh, you know, if you're in no contact right now, don't, (laughs) you know, don't contact him. 
but I want you to start focusing on you. Do something with that guilt. Put it towards something good. Volunteer at a homeless shelter. Volunteer at a a VA clinic. I don't know. Do something with it so that the guilt doesn't stop you. I'm not saying you don't have to feel bad. Absolutely. If you want to feel bad about it, great. The bad feelings can subside as you start healing yourself. And healing yourself means you have some realizations. You realize that, oh, I took his pleasure of hurting me away. Why am I feeling guilty about that? There's some contamination maybe inside your mind of what love is. And you may may need to work on a lot of self-love and self-compassion. And I want you to get this through your mind too, is that uh, you cannot ever be compassionate towards someone else without a lot of self-compassion first. You have to start within. Otherwise, what you give to others really isn't compassion. You have to be nice to yourself so that you can be genuinely nice to others. Because how do you know how to be nice? You got to be nice to yourself. Where does it come from? It comes from you. In order to be compassionate for someone else, you have to be compassionate for yourself first. If you're compassionate for yourself first, you don't take abuse. So how do you show compassion for someone else who's abusing you? You get out of that abuse. Because what that does is help them stop abusing. So that is a gift. I want you to see that as a gift. Because you leaving is compassionate for yourself. I didn't mean to discount it earlier. You were compassionate by leaving. You needed to protect yourself. But that is also a gift toward the person abusing you. Because now they're not abusing you anymore. That takes away that element of their dysfunction. And that is huge. That's called accountability. This is what happens when you abuse. I've given you this gift. This made the abuser accountable for his behavior and shows that, oh, when I abuse, people leave me. Ouch, maybe I shouldn't abuse anymore. I don't think that happens often, but hopefully that's what will happen. Hopefully he will realize that abusing means more pain in his life and he'll start putting those pieces together. But abusers really need to come to a place of uh, self-realization with that. They need to have enough experience and enough accountability and people like you that are willing to step away from it to show them what happens when they act that way. So, good job, Mary. You did the right thing. And I'm proud of you and I want you to send me an update sometime because you have a bright road ahead. You've got a lot of experience under your belt. You've been through hell and back. (laughs) And I want you to stay here. So send me an update sometime. Thank you so much for sharing that. We'll be right back. tell you about a company that I've uh, never talked about before and uh, it's about time that I did. It's uh, care.com. If you've never heard of them, go to care.com forward slash brain and check out what they're offering. I first heard of them a few weeks ago and I decided to check them out. I subscribed to the service and was immediately happy to learn that there are people that can clean our house other than my girlfriend and I. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's so hard to keep up with the messes that we create, so it's nice to see a service offer so many local people to take care of what we need when we need it. Even though I was particularly interested in the house cleaning people that were matched up with us, they have all kinds of family care services and the largest selection of local caregivers. One of the many things I appreciated is that you can see each person's general bio. You can tell if they're a smoker or not, if they're willing to travel, uh, if they're comfortable with animals. The whole gamut. You can tell what you're going to get before you get it. And let me say this. After looking at other options, I won't go anywhere else. It's really the most reputable, centralized place to find trusted resources while also guiding you through the process of choosing the right person. They even tell you how to interview candidates so that you know what to ask and what to look for. You can't beat this. I want you to find the best match for what you're looking for in an all-of-the-above way personally, emotionally, and by skill, so that you get exactly who you want. You know, as my mom gets up there in years, I worry about her. She lives alone, she barely manages those New England winters, and she does everything herself. I want her to be taken care of when no one else is there to do it. 
I want someone compassionate, reliable, engaging, and trustworthy. And I'm going to use care.com to make sure my mom gets just the right person to care for her when it's time. While I was using their system, one thing that really stood out is that the uh, helpers have uh, ratings next to them. That's very reassuring since I don't even know these people. (laughs) It's nice to know that whoever uses them rates them to give you an idea of how they'll show up for you. It makes me more comfortable. Thinking about my mom, did you know that by 2050, one quarter of the world's population will be 60 or older? One quarter. That's billions. People are living longer and care is going to be needed more than ever. So as you think about what care.com can do for you, whether it's for your kids, your parents, your pets, even your house. Visit care.com forward slash brain and look at the solutions they're offering you. When you sign up, you can save 30% off their premium membership just by going to that specific link, care.com forward slash brain. Subscribe and start the care you need right now. All right, welcome back. I'm going to read you an email from someone I'm going to call. I don't know. Let me think. Uh, Brady Bunch names. Uh, Alice. <laughs> I don't think I've used Alice yet. All right, Alice says, Hi, I've been binging on your podcast since I found it a month ago. Thank you. You're welcome, Alice. I've had a really hard time with a family matter. I'm in my mid-20s and I'm married. Earlier this year, my mom died suddenly and unexpectedly. My sisters, my dad, and I have all been grieving in different ways. I know grief is different for everyone, but my dad is hell-bent on coping and not healing from the loss. He said a friend of his uh, told him that healing would mean forgetting, but coping is vital, and he just needs to learn how to carry on. After talking with him so many times, I feel like his definition of that is moving on with his life. He started seeing someone in March, which my sisters and I feel is uh, much too soon. He's young, and we knew it was a good possibility that he'd find another partner, but we never imagined it would be so soon. I was the last of us to learn about the new girlfriend. The woman is someone I am acquainted with, and in general, she's a fine person. However, I do not feel like I have space in my life for anyone in her role, a new girlfriend to my widowed father. My dad and I have discussed my feelings, that I think it's too soon, that I don't wish to have a relationship of any sort with her at this time, and that my main desire is for him to have his family take priority. He assures me that he will meet me where I am and will not force anything on me. This sounds all well and good, but just the fact that he's already seeing someone, and it's serious, forces me to face a reality that I am just not open to. He's already figured out ways to include this new woman in trips to see my sisters, and my fear is that he'll soon start to include her with situations that involve me as well. He seems to be changing also. He's using language I've never heard him use. He's dressing differently. He's going on trips he's never showed interest in before. He recently went to a concert with this woman, something he'd never do with my mom. And when I heard that, it really hurt me. I feel very defensive of my deceased mother. I feel like I'm fighting to keep her relevant with him. I have always been close to my parents, and losing my mom has been the hardest thing I've ever gone through. I simply can't lose my dad to this woman. My husband and I are planning to add to our family soon, and just the thought of another woman being around in the place where my mom should be absolutely breaks my heart. I know there are times when we just have to bite our tongues, but I'm not sure how to go about this situation. He knows I'm not comfortable with this relationship. I know that I can't ask him to end it. So what do I do? Is there anything I can do to help this become easier for me? Thank you so much for your podcast. It has helped me learn to manage my catastrophic thinking and general anxiety. I appreciate all you do. All right, Alice. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I am sorry for your loss. I, you know, my mom's getting up in age and, um, we actually talk about that. We actually talk about what is going to happen when she dies. And it's good to have these conversations because then you find out what they want after they're gone. And uh, my mom wants, and this is kind of funny, <laughs> my mom wants the, I don't know, there's some death metal version of the sound of silence out there. I don't know if it's the one that I heard. I think it's by a band called Disturbed, but um, she loves it. <laughs> She said, I want that playing at my funeral. I'm like, really? Okay, (laughs) we'll do it. So um, we can talk about the inevitable and have a good conversation about it and not turn it into, you know, something awful that you're that we feel depressed about 
we just know that it's a part of life and we've come to accept that you know when death comes it comes and you just have to adapt and hopefully move on uh, just like your father needs to move on now there are a couple things I want to talk about here and um, one of them you probably won't like at all <laughs> in fact I might be hmm, more opposed to your response than I am with most people so I say this with love and kindness and respect for you um, I don't know if kindness is the word, but let's just say that I'm doing it out of complete respect and wanting you to be happy and also your father to be happy. So I'll get to that in a moment. But one of the things I want to mention first is that he said that a friend or you said that a friend of his told him that healing would mean forgetting and that coping is vital and he just needs to learn how to carry on. Of all the worst advice I've ever heard, that has got to be, I'm sorry, one of the worst pieces of advice I've ever heard. And I know that's your father's friend telling him that. And I don't know if you can play this for him, but that is the most untrue thing I've ever heard. Healing does not mean forgetting. Healing means letting go of the pain of loss, or at least in this case, the, the loss of someone in your life, so that you can move on and remember in a healthy way. Healing is all about healthy, positive, good memories to motivate you to go forward. You know, maybe that's a personal opinion of mine, but from what I've been through myself, all the losses in my life and uh, all the losses I've yet to have, healing is not going to be about forgetting. Healing is going to be about remembering in a new way. Healing isn't about letting it all go. Healing is about carrying them with you in a new, healthy, happy wonderful feeling way it's like i felt a breeze there's my wife i heard a whisper there's my wife you know you have these serendipitous events that happen to you and you can attribute it that maybe someone is watching over me and you take these events with you and you breathe them in and you feel great that's what healing is to me you know his friend must have gone through such pain and yes, there is coping involved too. The first thing you do when you lose someone is grieve. You, I mean, well, that's not the first thing. There's several stages of grieving. But, um, you know, you are you go through disbelief and then you go through um, wanting things to be different and then grieving. I don't know. I forget the, the order. But the grieving stage is when you accept that you've lost this person and there's no way they're coming back. You grieve. You know there's no way that they're coming back. But you don't forget about the person. You don't forget about the loss. You just gain a new understanding of how they fit in your life. I know they're not here anymore, but how do they now show up in your life? Like I said, the breeze, the whisper, the um, another person showing up as a, a, a support system. And it's like, wow, where did this person come from? Right when I needed them most. Which leads me to my second point, uh, which is what you may not be too happy to hear. <laughs> and I'm not normally this opposing. But before I say it, uh, I'm going to share a story with you. And if you've heard me say this before, then I'm going to reiterate it because it's very relevant. And it has to do with my mom, how we didn't see each other for years. Not because I didn't want to, but because I had moved away. I didn't really have the money to travel to see her. She doesn't fly <laughs> at all. And uh, if I was too far, like when I lived in California and Oregon, and she lived in New Hampshire, she wasn't going to drive. She doesn't mind driving, but it's a long way, and she refused to do it. And so we just didn't see each other for years. And it wasn't until I moved back to New Hampshire that I hadn't seen her for so long that I could finally reconnect with her. But while I was gone, I mean... I had moved away when I was like 20, and ever since then, I had only visited home a few times. And now I am, you know, I'm in my 40s, and I finally get to see her again. But, you know, during that time when I was gone, and we saw each other very little, she was almost always sad. She was sad that I was gone. I was 
what she calls her favorite son, which is <laughs> it's unfair. <laughs> I have a brother. He's fantastic. But because I was gone, she would say, he's my favorite son. And uh, so I, she would be really sad when I wasn't around, which was every day. So she would be sad every day. Uh, so one day she was talking to my sister. She shared this story with me later. She goes, I'm so sad Paul's gone. And she would cry a lot. And it would make me feel bad because now I'm in a situation where I'm far away and there's nothing I can do about it. But I would keep in touch with her and such. But so she's talking to my sister one day and she's telling her about, you know, her being sad that I'm not here and I wish we could be together. And and my sister asked her, well, is he happy? And she said, well, yeah, I mean, he's with his girlfriend and they sound like they're having a great time and everything's going well. So my sister asked my mom, isn't that what you want for him to be happy? And my mom just, I don't know what happened. She said she just stopped and she just had this shift and this realization. And she said, what do I want most for my son? Do I want him, regardless of his happiness, to be here with me so that I could be happy? Or is my bigger vision for him, for him to be happy? Because when I brought him into the world, I didn't bring him into the world to be stuck to my side. And I'm kind of making up some words here, but (laughs) uh, I brought him into the world so that he could experience life and go live it and be happy. And uh, my sister changed my mom's entire perception that day. My mom goes, yes, I do want him to be happy. And she shifted. She said, wow, I feel so much better because he is happy. He's out there living his life. He's happy. And that makes me happy. And so when she shared this with me, I was like, oh my God, that's, that's wonderful. I can't believe my sister said that. That's very wise. <laughs> and I've used that similar sentiment as a gauge in my life. I mean, you've heard it on this show many times. How do you love someone fully? You support their happiness. How do you show someone that you absolutely adore them? You support their happiness. How do you show someone that you want the best for them? Do you push your best onto them or do you support what's best for them in their eyes? Do you support what's what makes them happy? And this is where I'm going with you, Alice, is that you lost a mom. Your father lost a companion. Your father lost a support system. His other half, his identity just changed and it had to because a piece of him died that day and it was awful for him and for him to be suffering like that especially when someone says well you just need to cope and move on coping holds on to the unhealed part coping is great as a component of healing but it shouldn't be in place of healing so again i don't think that was very good advice from his friend But my point is, would you rather see your dad the way you want to see him, regardless of his happiness, or would you rather see your dad happy? Now, you might be wondering, well, can't I have both? (laughs) Can I have my dad and have this other woman be on the sidelines for a while because it's too soon for me? I want you to just imagine yourself in that position. You're with someone you love for years and years and years. You rely on each other. You support each other. Every decision, every thought, everything you do is shared with them. Every laugh is shared with them. Every tear is shared with them. And then one day they die. Where does the part of you go when that person dies? What happens to your heart? And how do you feel in a month? How do you feel in a few months? Where was your dad when your mom died? I mean, inside, emotionally. And were you okay with him being in that position just so you could all commiserate or just so you could all grieve together? I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just asking Did you appreciate that, that he was also in pain with you and that he should also suffer uh, just as long as everyone else? Because he was in a different position. 
he had a companion, he had a wife, and now another woman comes in who doesn't sound like she's trying to be your mom, she's just trying to be his companion. But where you are getting stuck is you are taking this personally as if he's inviting a stranger into the family to replace mom. Regardless if it feels that way or not, look at your dad. Is this person nurturing him, supporting him, making him laugh? Is she there for his tears? Is she there for his laughter? Is he laughing more? I mean, you said that he's starting to do different things. Is he down and out in his house sulking? Or is he living life, realizing how short life is? When you look at this person, your father, what do you really want for him? Do you want him to be happy? Because if this person is making him happy, what more could you ask for? So like I said, you may be opposed to what I'm saying here. You may not like it at all, but this is absolutely where I go. It's only been a few months. I know. I know it's only been, it's been such a short period of time and that's hard to accept. But how long should someone suffer from this loss? Let's go back to the example of you putting on his shoes. You trying it out here. You are with someone for years and years. You share everything. You laugh. You cry. And then they're gone. And now you're suffering. You're in pain. You're grieving. And then someone comes along and says, Hey, are you all right? And you're like, No, I lost the love of my life. Oh, if you need anything, let me know. Well, that's very nice of you. Thank you. And then they go off. And then you see them another week. And they're like, hey, I'm, I'm here if you need me. And you decide, okay, maybe I'll hang out with this person for a while. I'm not replacing the person that I lost. I'm just feeling the comfort of someone else who cares. What does that feel like when you're in the darkest space and someone who cares comes along? When I try that on, I feel not so alone anymore. I feel like someone is there to support me through my darkest times. Even with children, your children can do so much, but they aren't a companion. A companion is different. And from everything you described in your letter, it sounds like he's getting happier. If he's getting happier, isn't that what you want for your dad? You said you want your dad back, right? Do you want the dad back that is sad and lonely and scared of the future or not sure what's going to happen to him? Or do you want the dad that is experiencing life in a way that he's never experienced it, realizing that, wow, I could lose someone at any moment. I'm going to go to this concert because I've just never been to one. I'm going to dress like this because I want to feel young. I want to feel alive. And it sounds like your dad is doing his best, even walking that fine line between making sure he doesn't hurt his children and keeping someone in his life that sounds like it might be really good for him. So as you go forward with this, I want you to have a bigger vision of what your dad needs and wants in his life. Because it sounds like he was fully prepared to live the rest of his life with her had she lived. But now that she's gone and someone came along and is nurturing his heart, it might be time to put aside how you feel or transform how you feel into wanting him to be happy. And I think what you're dealing with here is that it's too soon. It's just too soon. And I'm going to come right back to what I said earlier. How long must one suffer before they feel good again? Is there a time frame? I personally don't think there is. I think a day <laughs> would be too soon. Maybe a week would be too soon. But after a month, I mean, I'm not putting a time frame here. But after a month, Every day, 24 hours a day of suffering and lonely, it can be pretty damn tough. So if this happened a few months later, it doesn't mean he's completely over your mom. It just means that he's healing. And it sounds like this person is helping him do that. And when I mentioned, you know, the breeze, hey, that's my wife. The whisper, hey, that's my wife. Why can't another person in the world 
be that serendipitous event that happens to him as if your mom from another place set it up. That's far out there. I'm not telling you you have to believe this. I'm just giving you a perspective that I believe will be healthier for you because I guarantee what will happen is that as you start supporting your dad and his happiness, he's going to feel so close, so accepted, so loved from every angle. If your entire family could support him and this new person in his life, he's not only going to get love, support, and happiness from his companion, but also from his kids. Talk about the best outcome for his healing. When love and support comes from all sides, that to me is a way to get this healing process rolling as fast as possible for everyone, not just your dad, for you too. No one's replacing your mom. No one ever will. He knows that no one can replace his wife. And he also knows that he doesn't want to be lonely anymore. So definitely grieve the loss of your mom and come to that acceptance that she is gone, yet she is also still there in your heart. And try not to see this as dad's new girlfriend or mom's replacement. Try to look at the big picture and see that dad is happy. That's what I want for you. I hope I didn't offend you. (laughs) I may not agree with you, but I absolutely want the best for you and your family. So I hope you can all come together in this and um, support each other. Thank you so much for writing, Alice. I appreciate you. We'll be right back to say goodbye and my final words after this. Thank you for listening to The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to thank today's sponsor, Care.com. Go to Care.com forward slash brain and check out all those people that can help you with your family, your pets, your home. You can get 30% off premium membership by going to Care.com forward slash brain. And I want to remind you of the mean workbook. What is that? That's the manipulation and emotional abuse number. What it is is an assessment of your relationship. Are you being emotionally abused? Do you even know what that is? Are you being manipulated? Do you feel to blame for all the problems in your relationship? Do you feel like no no matter what happens in the relationship, it's always more of a benefit to your partner than you? How about this? Do you feel like you're going crazy? If you resonate with any of this, go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash mean. It is a very revealing and enlightening process with a 200 point assessment system that will give you the tools and pinpoint exactly what's happening in your relationship. Check it out, theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash mean, M-E-A-N. And I want to thank the patron members. Patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com is where you can go to support the show. But hey, if you don't want to just support the show, but also get private episodes, worksheets, and even email coaching, that's what I offer you in return. So there's about, I don't know, 63, 64 episodes in the patron program that you've never heard and more to come. Imagine all those episodes of T.O.B. that you've never heard. (laughs) Go check it out. Patron.TheOverwhelmedBrain.com And finally, thank you to Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in The Overwhelmed Brain. And I'm going to close with another email. Sometimes I do this. It's from someone I'm going to call, uh, let's see, another Brady Bunch member. How about um, Cindy? (laughs) She writes, Hi, Paul. I'm a big fan of your podcast. You have helped me realize a lot of things about myself and helped me through the healing journey that I'm currently on. Very good to hear. Thank you for that, Cindy. Uh, I wanted your advice on a situation that I'm dealing with. I'm going through a breakup with my on-again, off-again boyfriend of several years. I'll spare you the details, but uh, we should have ended our relationship in year one. (laughs) She says, I know I'm making the right decision, however. The problem is that he cannot move out of my apartment right away for financial reasons. I told him he doesn't have to pay rent if that means he can save money and move out sooner. I'm really struggling financially, but in the end, it'll be worth it. He only really comes home to sleep, which is a plus. However, he does things that really bother me, like eats my food, doesn't clean up after himself, uses up my resources like toilet paper, toothpaste, towels. I know it doesn't sound like a big deal, but I feel like he's freeloading off of me. He drinks every day, and I keep finding beer bottles everywhere. On occasion, he comes home drunk and sleeps on the floor. It's becoming very stressful to live with him, and every time I see him, I get upset. I get jealous that he's out having a good time with his friends. I've tried asking him to be more considerate, but he completely disregards me. I can't talk to him without getting angry and saying nasty things. 
I hate myself for being this way and it's only around him. He has one more month before I actually kick him out. But how can I keep my cool during that month? I'm in a good place, for the most part, when he's not around and I feel like I've made progress. But when I'm around him, I feel like I'm being tested and I fail every time. Yes, I'm still hurt, angry, and jealous. How can I control my emotions around him? I want to be in a place where I'm not so emotional around people that hurt me. I know you get a lot of emails, so I'd really appreciate you taking the time to read this. Thank you. Okay, wow, Cindy, thank you so much for sharing this. Uh, I don't know if you're going to hear this in time, um, but I have a feeling that when the month is up, he's not going to leave. There's something I want to mention now in your email, and I absolutely need you to absorb this and start applying it right away. One of the things that you said was, I know it doesn't sound like a big deal, but I feel like he's freeloading off of me. It is a huge deal. There's so much going on in this email that tells me what's happening with you and in this situation. Not only is he freeloading off of you, you are enabling it. You are causing it to be the way it is or at least in some of your behaviors. And I can tell the way you wrote this that you are one of those people that are just too kind and really can't see too much fault and you try to see the best in everyone. This person is taking advantage of you and it does not sound like it's going to change. This person will need to be kicked out somehow. It's just my personal opinion. (laughs) But he comes home drunk, he drinks every day, there's beer bottles everywhere. Uh, It's becoming stressful to live with him. And every time you see him, you get upset. You need to get him out as soon as possible because you're doing so much for him. You're not giving him any accountability. If there's beer bottles on the floor, you know, if that's me, I'm going to say, hey, if I find beer bottles on the floor again, you're out. (laughs) You're out the next day. Hey, if you're going to drink every night, I don't want to live with you. You're out. Hey, if you're going to eat my food without paying for it, you're out. That's just me. (laughs) I've gotten more strict with the people in my life that break through my boundaries, that violate my boundaries. But just that one sentence, I know it doesn't sound like a big deal, but I feel like he's freeloading off of me. That says a lot. That right there tells me that you do not see the importance of you. You do not see your own self-worth. You do not see that when someone takes advantage of you, that it's not important enough to protect yourself it's more important to accommodate them enable them don't provide any accountability for them instead of protect yourself i need you to look at you and go wait a minute i'm much more important than this person treats me i need to fix this situation right away no waiting if you don't pack up and leave by tomorrow i'm whatever call the police call Call your big brother Al. I don't know. But stop enabling him. Now, I know that sounds like what you're working on. You say you can't control your emotions around him and you want to be in a place where you're not so emotional around people that hurt you. I need you to prioritize your boundaries and your values above your emotions. I know, that's a challenge. (laughs) Get my Stop Self-Sabotage worksheet on my website and find out what you value most. Find out what you value most in a relationship. Find out what you value most in a roommate even. And it'll walk you through the process. But what you'll find out is as you list your values and you prioritize them, I can pretty much guarantee at the top of your list is not, I want someone to freeload (laughs) off of me. I want someone to eat my food without paying for it. Probably at the top of your list is wanting someone who treats you with respect. Is wanting someone who believes in equality and fairness and paying you for the resources they use. Probably a lot of things like that. The problem is you're not in alignment with those values. You are just going through life probably afraid of confrontation or worrying what someone might think of you if you tell them to leave or tell them that you're not happy. I'm going to take a big guess here and say that if you told him that you're not happy with this situation, he's going to find a way to make you feel bad about yourself. And that'll be his in all the time. If it's not that, it's something like that. 
he'll find something that he says that hurts you in a way that makes you feel bad about yourself so that you don't protect yourself. And when you don't protect yourself, people walk on you. This probably has to do with people pleasing. If you've been brought up to neutralize situations and keep the balance, keep the peace, then you may have misinterpreted that to allow yourself to be walked on like a doormat. This involves you building a strength in yourself where you can look at you and go, I'm more important than the way I'm being treated. And get to a point where you say, I don't care about the consequences. This is not right for me. This is outside my values. This is a violation of my values. This is a violation of my boundaries. This is not right for me. I don't care what it takes. I'm going forward with honoring myself. Get my book, The Overwhelmed Brain, Personal Growth for Critical Thinkers. It walks you through this whole process. If you're someone that enables the bad behavior of others, you'll never get what you want. Even when you kick this person out, when you get into another relationship and bad behavior starts, you need to stop it right away. You need to say, hey, that's not right for me. That's disrespectful. I want to be treated better than that. If you can't treat me better than that, I am willing to let go of this relationship to protect me. This is all about self-protection, self-nurturing, self-compassion, self-love. That's the direction I want you to go in. Find my episodes on people-pleasing. Find my episodes on enabling. Find my episodes on self-love, self-compassion, self-nurturing. Get the self-sabotage workbook and get the overwhelmed brain book. He's using up all your resources and I'm giving you resources that you can use. How about that? (laughs) Thank you so much, Cindy. I know there's a lot more to this. There's a lot more depth. I know that maybe you're feeling it's scary to be confrontational. And uh, this is why I talk about this in so many episodes. So I'm just going to give you this as an impetus to start protecting yourself, honoring yourself and going in that direction. So do all that. And the way you do all that is you keep your mind open so that you can step into your power and be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you, you are amazing. Amazing.